okay? All right, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight is the fourth night of our series entitled The Closing Crisis. And tonight to introduce our topic, I want to just briefly, briefly remind you that this week your church has chosen the theme of the closing scenes of the life of Christ. And I've been, I've been reminding you night by night, there is a need for us to study those closing scenes because those closing scenes help us understand more fully the magnitude of what sin is and the price that was paid for sin. But remarkably, those closing scenes, they foreshadow what God's people will go through again in the last days. So night by night we've been looking at this, and tonight before we look at the specifics of Jesus' experience, there are two characters that are mentioned in Scripture in the closing life of Jesus. One is only recorded by one gospel, and the other is recorded by every gospel. And I think you can understand at least who that one would be. Peter and his denial of Christ was recorded by every single gospel writer. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke, it's in John. But there is one man's story in the closing scenes of Jesus' life that is only recorded by one person. It was only recorded by Mark. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible, open with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, and I want to ask you to look with me at verse 50. Mark 14 and verse 50. The Bible says, And they all forsook him and fled. Now, before we go on, maybe we should establish where, where, when and where are we reading about? When does this take place? Where is it? It's in Gethsemane, it's on Thursday night, right? And I want you to notice that the Bible says in verse 50, as we just read, that they all forsook him. Now, we have to be careful because the word all that's used here is describing a specific group of people. Now, just as a way of review, who was in the garden that night? Okay, Jesus was there. Who else? Yeah, okay, the disciples. Who else? Judas and the mob, right? And the mob was comprised of religious leaders as well as some soldiers. Isn't that right? And so that night in the garden, all these people come together. But the Bible specifically says... It specifically says in verse 50 that they all, what? They all forsook him. Now, when it says all, the word all is specifically referring to the disciples. If that's clear, can you say amen? Because I know not everybody left the garden. Isn't that right? Not everybody. Only the disciples left. If it, does that make sense? Only the disciples. Now, that's important because now we come to verse 51. And in verse 51, the Bible says, And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man laid hold on him. Verse 52 says, And he left the linen cloth and fled from them. How? Naked. Now, this little story is only recorded by Mark. No one else records this. Only Mark. Whereas the denial of 
Jesus, uh, uh, or Peter's denial of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everybody has that. But this, only Mark. And some commentators believe that that's because this was John Mark. I'm not concerned with that tonight as much as I am interested in why the Bible records this story here in Mark. I'm interested in that. I want to know why does the Bible record this particular story. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to ask you, without naming, you know, like I said, you know, commentators believe it was John Mark. That's not so important to me as is the question, who was this young man? Now, just from verse 50, you automatically know that the young man in this story is not a disciple. If that's clear, can you say that? Some of you are asking, how did you know that? How do you know he's not a disciple? Because it said that they all forsook him. Which means that by, that, by, by default, if they all forsook him, all the disciples... The man who is mentioned in verse 51 must not have been a disciple. If that's clear, can you say amen? I just want to establish that. The next question is, was he one of the people that came to trap Jesus? No. Someone said no. And you're right. But how could you prove that? Did you notice that the people in the mob, what did they do? They grabbed him. If they tried to grab him, that means that he wasn't what? He wasn't one of the, he, he wasn't part of the mob, right? Does that make sense? The mob did not identify him as one of their own. So what do we have here? We have a man who is not a disciple. He's not one of the 12. He wasn't one of those people that gave up everything and left their jobs and followed. He's not one of those. But he is not one of the mob that came to trap Jesus. Does that make sense? He's not in group A and he's not in group B. Now, I don't know if you, are get, or if you figured out where I'm going with this. When I look at this story, the man in the story reminds me of a specific group of people at the very end of time. Because Jesus said that you're not hot and you're not cold. Instead, you are what? Lukewarm. Let's come to Revelation 3 for a moment. I'm going to ask you to just come over to Revelation 3. We're going to come back to Mark in just a bit. But I just have to share with you the parallel that I see here. Revelation 3, I want to ask you to look with me starting in verse 15. Jesus said, I know thy what? Thy works, that thou art neither what? Cold nor hot. And then Jesus says, I would that thou wert cold or hot. Now, before we move on, I want us to be very specific. I want us to look at what it means to be cold and what it means to be hot. So I'm going to ask you to, to keep your finger in Revelation 3 and come back with me to Matthew 24, if you will. Matthew 24, and I'm going to ask you to look with me at verse 12. Matthew 24 Look with me at verse 12. Matthew 24, verse 12. The Bible says, And because iniquity shall abound, Jesus is describing the last days, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax how? Cold. Now, folks, notice that when the Bible talks about cold in the spiritual sense, it's not talking about, you know, literal frigid temperature. It's talking about being spiritually, your love is dead. Now, if you were with us yesterday, I shared with you that love and righteousness are one and the same. Which means if you have no love, you're not living in harmony with God's law. Does that make sense? 
Because love is the fulfilling of the law. Is that right? And so we have a people at the, at the end of time, Jesus describes their cold, their love has waxed cold. In other words, sin has taken over in their life. Now, hot is the opposite. Turn with me to Romans 12, if you will. Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to ask you to look with me at verse 11. Romans 12, verse 11. And I want you to notice the Bible says, not slothful in business. It says, what's the next word there? Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, the word fervent in the original language is the Greek word zeo. And it literally means to boil. Okay? Now, you know that if something is boiling, it is very what? It's hot. So, fervent in spirit is the experience of someone who is literally on fire for Jesus. Does that make sense? Now, you know, the Bible says about Laodicea, come back there with me in, in Revelation 3, if you will, because I want you to notice that the Bible is specific. It says in verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert what? Cold or hot. Now, some of you are sitting here and thinking, that's odd. I know that you understand that Jesus wants us to be hot. I think you understand that. Can you say amen? amen? He wants us to be fervent in spirit, on fire, zealous, willing to work. But some of you are scratching your head and saying, why, why, why would Jesus say, I wish that you were cold or hot? You know, if you really think about it, A person who is cold has a greater chance to be saved because a person who is cold knows that they are lost. Does that make sense? The danger of Laodicea, and really this young man in the story is a classic illustration He's not one of the disciples. He's not the part of the mob. He's in between. And when you're in between, the danger is that you think you're saved when in reality you're really lost. Now I want you to know that Jesus is clear that he would prefer us to be hot or cold. Thank you. <laughs> Why? Because at least if a person is cold, they know, I mean, they know that they're not right with God. Their life is clearly, is clearly out of harmony with God's will. And you know, when you're cold, you experience the fruitage of being cold. You're, you have emptiness. You have, you know, all kinds of difficulties in your life when you wander from God. And you know what? In that condition, like the prodigal son, you realize that you are desperately hungry and your father could take so much better care of you. But you know what the problem is with Laodicea? The problem with this young man? The problem is that when you're in between, you actually feel okay. You don't feel bad. You don't feel lost. And you know, it's amazing to me because today we're in an age where social media has gotten so many people in trouble. Have you noticed this? Um, this is a true story. I know of a conference where ministers were let go because of what they posted on social media. They just said, look, this is inconsistent with the Christian lifestyle. I'm sorry, you have to go. And I want to tell you that when I was pastoring, you know, it, it's strange because, you know, you, you have members that come to church and then, you know, you, you add them on Facebook and then all of a sudden you discover that they smoke marijuana, you know? <laughs> and you, you're like, why, you know, what, 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 is the, what is the, like, you know, when you look at some of these things, you start to think, okay, how is it that you can be coming to church but then living this alternate lifestyle, you know? <laughs> 
And folks, I'm not here to try to uh, go through a laundry list of things. The reason I'm saying this is because there are a lot of people that don't recognize their true condition. They're in between. And they come to church and they're active and involved. Then they go back and then they have a totally different lifestyle. And in that condition, Laodicea in that condition is more hopeless than someone who's completely out in the world. That's why Jesus said, I wish that you were cold or hot. Now, I got to tell you that as we look at the message to Laodicea, Jesus says this. Verse, please, look, come back with me to verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my what? Now, some of you might be confused. Like, what is this imagery? You know, is Laodicea mouthwash for Jesus? Or what, why does it say, spew thee out of my mouth? Like, what is that imagery? What is that for? So, you just need to look at the language of the verse. Because, first of all, some of you may know the name Laodicea. Do you know what that name means? It means a people judged. Does that make sense? Now, if I asked you, what time period of the Christian church would Laodicea apply to? You would probably tell me that it applies to God's people from the time period from 1844 and on. Does that make sense? Because since 1844... We have been living in the final judgment. Isn't that right? Now, I want to ask you a question. In the judgment, what is Jesus doing for us? He's interceding. And folks, if Jesus is interceding for us in heaven, it means that he speaks on our behalf. Does that make sense? He speaks on our behalf because that's the work of the, of, the, of the priest during the judgment. Does that make sense? But if Jesus spews us out of his mouth, it means that he will no longer intercede for us. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus is saying when he says that in the judgment, if you're not hot, I'm sorry, yeah, well, if you're not hot, then Jesus is going to spew you out of his mouth. Now, I want to ask you to look with me at verse 17. <clears throat> now, my message is really not on just Laodicea tonight, but I'm sure that many of you know that this message is specifically for God's people in the last days, and I couldn't resist uh, the desire to study it with you tonight. Verse 17 of Revelation 3 Jesus said, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art what? Wretched. Now, Jesus is being very, very clear. He is saying that Laodicea thinks that they're rich, they have all these things, but their true condition is that they are wretched. And let me tell you, that word wretched only appears one other place in the New Testament. Only one other place. It's in Romans 7. And when Paul describes a man who is convicted of sin, he knows that he's living wrong, but he has no power to overcome it. The man in desperation, he cries out, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? In other words, the wretched condition is the condition of someone who knows that they're doing wrong, but they have no power in their life to overcome sin. Does that make sense? And that's Laodicea. That's the condition of Laodicea that Jesus describes. Verse 17 says, And knowest not that thou art wretched, and what else? Miserable. Guess what? That word miserable also only appears one other place in the New Testament. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to turn there, you don't have to turn there. But in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about if Jesus didn't resurrect, if there is no hope of eternal life, then we out of all humanity, out of all men, are the most miserable. You know, folks, 
Laodicea, they are trying to pretend that they are Christians. And they've given up part of the world. The problem is they haven't given up all of it. And as a result, they miss out on eternal life too. They miss out on part of the world and they miss out on part of eternal life. And by doing that, of all men, they are the most what? Miserable. And then the Bible says in verse 17, and poor, now, This goes without saying, but in Scripture, to be rich is to have faith that works by love. It's compared to gold. And that means that Laodicea, if they're poor, that means they don't have faith. May I ask you the question, where does faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing from the Word of God. I want to ask you, if you wanted to increase faith, What habit must you cultivate in order to increase faith? Study of the Bible. (laughs) Does that make sense? It's just that simple. Laodicea thinks they already know it all. And so they don't want to study. They're poor. And of course it says in verse 17, blind. Now, this is interesting uh, turn with me, if you will, to 2 Peter 1, verse 9. I just want to show you this. 2 Peter 1. <coughs> 2 Peter chapter 1. And verse 9. The Bible says, and Peter has given a list of these virtues there starting from verse 5. Then he says in verse 9, but he that lacketh these things is what? Is blind and cannot see afar off. They don't have the fruits of the Spirit. And not only that, but they lack spiritual discernment. <clears throat> Excuse me. They cannot see what's coming. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his what? His old sins. Now, folks, spiritual blindness, Peter tells us, is lacking the fruit of the Spirit. It's not having the faith to know that Jesus is coming soon. It is also living in the past. You've forgotten that Jesus forgave you, and you're dwelling on all of those old things from your past life. Laodicea's condition, there's one more thing. Revelation chapter 3 and verse uh, 17, the Bible says, and naked. Now, I think most of us will know that in Scripture, the righteousness of Christ is compared to a garment. And so if you're naked, it simply means that you're not clothed with the righteousness of Christ. This is Laodicea's condition. And let let me share with you, back in Mark 14, this is exactly what the young man went through. I'm going to ask you to come back to Mark 14. So, for those of you that are just joining us, we're looking at two men in the life of Jesus in those closing scenes. One is mentioned in every gospel. One is mentioned in only one. But these men are here to teach us an important lesson. Mark 14, I'm going to ask you to look with me at verse 51. There followed him a certain young man Having a what kind of cloth? A linen cloth. Now, I could take you to Revelation chapter 19, and I could show you that linen represents the righteousness of the saints. I could show you that, but I think you already know that. But I want you to notice how he was dressed. I want you to notice this. In verse 51, it says, having a linen cloth, what's the next word? Cast about. Now, you know, I can't be, I can't say this with certainty, but here's my guess. This young man was asleep. And he was awoken with the news that Jesus was in the garden and a mob had come. And so in the dark, he fumbles about and gets his clothes. But because it's dark, he can't put it on properly. Like he just, you know, he gets it on. Okay, 
and then he runs and he rushes into the garden. But do you notice that the Bible says that he's not wearing anything underneath? And I did a little bit of research on this. The, the ancient Hebrews, and even to the time of Jesus, they wore undergarments. It's not like they just put on a, you know, like a, I don't know what you call those, like robes and had nothing. No, they wore undergarments. But this man, in this particular instance, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that while he put on that linen garment, he was completely naked underneath. I want you to know that I believe that the reason why the Scripture records this detail is just to give us a simple but profound truth. Naked, the first time nakedness ever appears in the Bible, the first time, is in the Garden of Eden. And you know what happened? It was when after man sinned that he realized that he was naked. And let me tell you, folks, that nakedness, that, because it appears the first time, it sets the meaning for what it means throughout scriptures figuratively. It's called the law of first appearance. And so when that happens, this, this young man is kind of an illustration that the only thing that covers our sinfulness is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing. Now, every morning when you wake up and you get on your knees, you have the privilege to be clothed with the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Every morning you have that chance. Because as you confess your sins, as you ask for Jesus to fill you, to indwell, to have His Spirit live within you, you can be clothed with that righteousness. And I want to tell you that it's one thing to get that righteousness, but it is another thing altogether to keep the righteousness. Now, look, look, look at the story. It says, having a, okay, and there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the what? The young men laid hold on him. In verse 51, did you notice that the word young appears twice? Did you notice that? There, this certain man is young. And you know who grabbed him? Young men grabbed him. We have some young men here in the audience tonight. And I want to say this. I believe that Satan's most effective temptations come to us in the form of our peers. Does that make sense? In other words, you know, when Satan brings something of a temptation, it's usually couched in the form or presented by one whom we consider to be an equal. It wasn't the old men, it wasn't the priests, it wasn't the soldiers, it was the young men that grabbed him. And guess what? He has a choice now. I want to ask you, I want you to think about this. I want you to think, what two choices does this young man have right here? What two choices does he have? Think about it. What, cho what choices does he have? Stay or go. Now, you have to think. I want you to think with me for a moment. What's going to happen if he stays? He's going to have some kind of suffering, right? But is there a plus side to staying? Is there a plus side, yes or no? What's the plus side? He gets to keep his, his garment right? He, he doesn't have to be naked, right? He gets to keep the, 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 the robe, right? Or if he runs away, he can escape the suffering, but he's going to lose the garment. Have you ever thought that in every instance in life, you always have the same two choices? Have you ever thought that? Can I tell you a true story? There was, in high school, we had to read this book. It was called The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Anybody read that book? 
Some of you have. There's a story in there. You can go back and check me on this. Corey Ten Boom had a sister. And her sister's name was Bessie. And one day, now the Ten Boom family, they were watchmakers. And so in, there in, in Holland, they had a little watch shop. And folks, I didn't know this, but during World War II, Holland as a country, as a country, harbored refugees from Poland and Germany that were being persecuted by the Nazis. As a whole country, they did that. Well, the Ten Booms did have some Jews in their home. And one day, a knock came at the door. So the sister, Bessie, opened the door, and there were soldiers from the German army. I think there was Gestapo. And they said to Bessie, they said, where are the Jews that you're hiding? Did you notice they didn't say, are you hiding Jews? <laughs> no, that's not, that wasn't the question. They said, where are the Jews you're hiding? So now she has the same choice that the young man in the garden had. Do you know what her two options are? Let's think. What are her two options? She could tell the truth, but if she does, what's going to happen? She's probably going to get killed along with all the other Jews. Or what could she do? She could lie. And if she lies, she might save herself and her friends. Now, I know that there are some of you in here that are thinking tonight, wouldn't it be okay to lie in order to save human life? I want to tell you that Jesus' words are very simple. Jesus said, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. That's Ro Revelation 2, verse 10. Jesus never said, no matter what, save your own life. His words were, be faithful unto what? Unto death. So Bessie decided, I'm just going to tell the truth. She decided to stay with Jesus and suffer. So here's what happened. She said, hey, they're hiding under the kitchen table. So the soldiers came in. They came to the kitchen table. They looked underneath. Nobody was there. They looked through the whole house. They went through every closet, every door. They didn't find anybody. <laughs> and then they left. But she did tell the truth because what, Bessie, what actually Bessie didn't tell them Underneath the kitchen table, there was this big rug. And if you move the table and you move the rug, there was like a door in the on the floor. And if you opened it, there were, I think, five. I think that's how many there were that were listening with bated breath, with their hearts thumping, because they knew that the soldiers were looking for them. You know, friends, I want to share with you that if you really think about it, in every temptation in life, we are faced with those very two same options. Stay with Jesus, keep the righteousness, or leave Jesus, but lose the righteousness. And I want you to know that this young man, he made the decision. In verse 52, he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now, friends, this story is in the Bible because God wanted us to realize that even this young man, he had a choice to make. And we can learn from his mistake. Now, there is another man that I want us to look at tonight. I'm going to ask you to come over with me just a little bit further now. Mark chapter 14, look with me down at verse 66. Mark 14, verse 66. The Bible says, And as Peter was beneath in the palace, 
there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 16. But he denied, saying, I know not. Neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crowed. Now, yesterday I briefly mentioned about the denial that, of Peter's denial of Jesus. But tonight I want to just focus a little bit more on this, and I want to read to you from that timeless classic, The Desire of Ages. <clears throat> and I want to just make a contrast about Peter here. This is from The Desire of Ages, and I'll give you the reference in just a moment. Peter had not designed that his real character should be known. In assuming an air of indifference, he had placed himself on the enemy's ground, and he became an easy prey to temptation. If he had been called to fight for his master, he would have been a courageous soldier. But when the finger of what? Scorn was pointed at him, he proved himself a coward. Now, notice the application. Many who do not shrink from active warfare for their Lord, are driven by what? Ridicule to deny their faith. By associating with those whom they should avoid, they place themselves in the way of temptation. They invite the enemy to tempt them and are led to say and do that which under other circumstances they would never have been guilty. Now, before I finish reading the statement, I have seen a phenomenon as I've been holding evangelistic meetings across the country for about 11 years. Uh, I'm close to getting to like 100 meetings. That's not a lot. There are some evangelists that are in the 300s, but I'm getting close to the 100 mark. And one of the amazing things that I've discovered is that when we hold public meetings and people come to church from the community, And they'll see some of the members in the church and they'll actually say, I didn't know you were a Seventh-day Adventist. And you know what's funny about that? Well, I don't know if it's funny. No, maybe it's not funny. But what's ironic about that is that I ask myself, what kind of life are they living that the person doesn't even know that they're a Seventh-day Adventist? It's like, maybe like Peter, when they go into that group of people, they pretend to be just like them because they don't want to look different. And I got to tell you that this phenomenon, I believe, is not uncommon. I think that there are people that kind of just chameleon-like become whatever environment that they're in. Peter, that's what he was trying to do. He didn't want to be seen. And why? Because he was afraid of ridicule. Now, please notice the disciple of Christ who in our day disguises his faith through dread or suffering or reproach denies his Lord as really as did Peter in the judgment hall. That's from the Desire of Ages, page 712. You know, friends, as we look at the story of Peter, it just reminds us of the power of association. And I know from my own life, um, I almost got kicked out of college. I basically did get kicked out, but my parents intervened. But why? Because of association. Okay? And you know, the truth is that when you are with people that don't believe as you do, whether you realize it or not, you're influenced by them. And, you know, this is probably more relevant for when we're younger. As we're older, I think we're more selective, but especially young people as they think about their associations. You may not realize it, but those friends you have, they are going to impact your character. They're going to affect what you say and what you do. Now, The the title of my message today is Endurance, and this is really the reason why. So I'm now getting into the life of Christ. Now, did you know 
that between the Garden of Gethsemane and the cross, Jesus went through seven tribunals. Seven tribunals. Let's count them, okay? He went to uh, Ananias, right, the high priest. And I don't know if you know the history of why there's Ananias and Caiaphas, but the, the idea is something like this. Uh, Caiaphas was the high priest that the Jews had chosen, but he was set aside by the Roman governor, and so they had, is it Annas or Ananias? But anyway, they had uh, Annas, and then he went, Jesus went before the Sanhedrin twice. So Annas, Caiaphas, Sanhedrin twice. Then he went to Pilate. And do you know what Pilate did? Pilate sent him to Herod, right? And then Herod said, ah, I don't want it. And then Herod sent him back to Pilate. So not once, not twice, but seven times Jesus was arraigned before earthly tribunals. Now, I want to ask you, was Jesus put through an extraordinary, and you know this, if you know the, the, the scenes, Jesus was beaten, he was, beard was ripped out, he got whipped by Pilate. Was Jesus, uh, was Jesus tested during these particular tribunals? Was he tested? Was his patience tested during this time? Yes or no? Absolutely. That's why the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Did you know that some translations of the Bible say, here is the endurance of the saints. That's why I picked the title tonight, Endurance. You know, I'm going to spend a lot of time on the trial of Jesus this Sabbath. I'm going to spend a lot of time on it. But for tonight, I want to focus on the parallel experience that God's people are going to have concerning these tribunals. And I want you to look with me at these statements. Now, while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Now, notice these next words. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. I want to ask you, is Satan studying us, yes or no? You know... They say that the government has a dossier on different individuals, and that wouldn't surprise me. But can you imagine that Satan is studying your character to try to understand how best he can overthrow you? And do you realize that when the final crisis comes, Satan is going to lob the most devastating attack possible against the weakness of your character. Now, if you knew that was coming, what would you try to do? What would you try to do? I'd try to become stronger in the areas that I was weak. Does that make sense? And that's what, the, that's what we're being told, that Satan is trying to to exploit these weaknesses. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in what time? The time of trouble. Okay, so let me read for you <coughs> a little bit about our need to prepare for what's coming. God does not give us the spirit of martyrs today, for we have not come to the point of martyrdom. He is now testing us by smaller trials and crosses. Now, let's pause. 
Is God trying to prepare us for what is coming? Yes. Is there going to be a crisis ahead of us? Yes. But today, right now, what is God allowing for us to experience in a way to prepare us for what's coming? He allows us to experience smaller what? Trials and crosses. Every day, we are being shown what our weaknesses are. For some of you, it might be impatience. For some of you, it might be intemperance. For some of you, it might be indulgence. Everyone has a different thing. But God allows those trials every day. Why? In anticipation to prepare us for what is coming. I'm going to finish this statement. And at, that t- and, at, and at times when it seems that the billows of temptation will go over our heads, let us remember that the eye of God is watching over us. And let us be willing to endure all the trials He sees fit to send. Okay, so this is from the Review and Herald. And here's what it says. It does not seem possible to us now that any should have to stand how? Alone. Now listen to this statement. But if God has ever spoken by me, the time will come when we shall be brought before councils and before thousands for His name's sake. And each one will have to give the reason for his faith. Then will come the severest criticism upon every position that has been taken for the truth. Now, I don't know if you caught the magnitude of that statement. I'm going to read to you a few more, but Jesus was brought, not once, not twice, but how many times? Seven times before an earthly tribunal. And we are being told that the time will come when each of us will stand alone. And when that time comes, they're going to ask some questions. I want you to notice the last part of that. Then will come the what kind of criticism? The severest criticism upon every position. If someone asked you today, <clears throat> why do you believe that Jesus will come back a second time? Could you make a defense of that truth from the Bible? Now, you don't need to raise your hand. I'm just, you know, you don't need to nod your head. I'm just asking you this. If someone asked you why you believe that we are living in the time of the judgment right now, could you make a biblical defense of our belief in Daniel 8.14? If someone asked you, <clears throat> why do you believe that the dead are asleep in the graves awaiting one of two resurrections? Could you make a biblical defense of our understanding of what happens to man and man's nature in death? Now, do you know why I'm asking you this? Because the time will come when we will be tested upon points of our faith by people of intellect. They're going to ask some serious questions. And I have to be honest. I look at my own knowledge of the Bible, and I feel like I don't know enough. And I preach evangelistic sermons as a living. (laughs) And I want you to know, I have met some members that can run circles around me, like lay people. So I know that there are lay people out there that really know their Bibles. But could I say that on average, most members are comfortable with a few things. But you know those fine points, like how can you prove from history that October 22 of 1844. Like, how do you know that? Oh, the Karaite calendar? Which Karaite calendar? You know, like some of these fine points, 
s- some of us would be clueless to know, like, how do we know that 457 BC? Like, how could we prove that from secular history? And you know why I'm saying that? I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not trying to discourage anyone tonight. The reason I'm saying this is because we have a chance right now. Remember Joseph? When Joseph knew what was coming, what did Joseph do? He stored up food, isn't that right? He started saving up. Right now, you should be storing up your mind. Putting the the facts, putting the knowledge, putting the understanding in there. Why? Because someday you're going to stand alone. Notice how she said it. She said, if God has ever spoken by me, the time will come when we shall be brought before councils and before thousands for his name's sake. I'm going to read it from another book, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. The members of the church will, be indi- will individually be tested and proved. They will be placed in circumstances where they will be forced to bear witness for the truth. Many will be called to speak before councils and in courts of justice, perhaps separately, and what else? Alone. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, The law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment. Those who are arraigned before the what? The courts make a strong vindication of the truth. And some who hear them are led to take their stand to keep all the commandments of God. Thus, light will be brought before thousands who otherwise would know nothing of these truths. I want to ask you, if you were put before a court, and they had the cameras shining on you. Now you're on CNN. You're on Fox, no, not Fox News, but you're on another channel, okay? And you're there, and as, you're, as everyone's looking at you, they're asking you the questions, could you give an answer for the reason of the hope that is within you, with meekness and with fear? You know why I'm reading this to you? Because Jesus was brought before the tribunals, And we are being told that this history will repeat itself. And you know what? Right now, we have an opportunity. We have the books, the internet. We have 3ABN. We have all these wonderful resources. We should be filling up and storing up for what's going to come. I'm going to read to you a few more, and then I'll close. When the final warning shall be given, it will arrest the attention of these leading men through whom the Lord is now working. And some of them will accept it and will stand with the people of God through the time of trouble. Isn't that encouraging, folks? Can you say amen? Amen. Some of you, by your testimony, by your simple but sincere and earnest explanation of scriptures, will be the means by which the great men of the world will be converted and they will stand with God's people. That sounds exciting. Can you say amen? Amen. Even young people, listen to this, even young people, the, pris- the principles necessary for our youth to cultivate must be kept before them in their daily education, that when the decree shall go forth requiring all to worship the beast and his image, they may make the right decisions and have strength to what? To declare without wavering their confidence in the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, even at the very time when the law of God is made void by the religious world. Now, folks, I want to ask you, will young people be called upon to speak for God and to give a defense of their faith? Will they be asked yes or no? They will. It goes on, those who waver now and are tempted to follow in the wake of apostates who have departed from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, will surely be found on the side of those who make void the law of God unless they repent and plant their feet firmly upon the faith once delivered to the saints. I'm going to go quickly because I'm running out of time. Parents, ask yourselves the solemn question. Have we educated our children to yield to parental authority and thus trained them to obey God, to love Him, to hold His law as the supreme guide of conduct and life? Have we educated them to be missionaries for Christ, to go about doing good? Believing parents, your children will have to fight decisive battles for the Lord in the day of conflict. And while they win victories for the Prince of Peace, they may be gaining triumphs for themselves. 
But if they have not been brought up in the fear of the Lord, if they have no knowledge of Christ, no connection with heaven, they will have no moral power and they will yield to earthly potentates who have assumed to exalt themselves above the God of heaven in establishing a spurious Sabbath to take the place of the Sabbath of Jehovah. You know, maybe because I have children, these statements are especially pointed to me. But friends, tonight, I hope that the point has been made abundantly clear. Jesus was brought before earthly tribunals, and that very thing will happen again. And you know what? It's not going to be easy. We need the patience or the endurance of the saints. You know, it's one thing to endure being physically punched. It's another thing to endure people lying about you. Jesus had to go through both. And, you know, friends, tonight I'm going to ask you to take your hymnal, and I'm going to ask Audrey to play for us number 315. When I was in college, I learned to love this song. It has a fascinating backstory. But as we sing this song tonight, I'm going to make a simple invitation as we close our message, and I'm going to ask our pastor to have our prayer again. The invitation is very simple. Maybe there are some of you that have recognized that you were like that young man in that garden. You were one of the disciples that gave up everything to follow Christ. And yet, you're not so callous that you're going to be part of the mob that wants to come and trap Jesus. Like Laodicea, you're somewhere in between. And God is inviting us to be hot or cold. And friends, tonight as we sing number 315, as we sing this hymn, if you're willing to say, Lord, tonight, I want to be hot. I don't want to be lukewarm. And whatever it might be that would be necessary to make that a reality. Maybe you have to stop doing something. Maybe you have to start doing something. But whatever it is, As we sing number 315, speak with Jesus in your heart. Number 315.